let's get started. Um, so we are entering the second half of the course. Um, and in the first half, we learned a lot about lossless compression. And in the second half, we'll start exploring the lossy compression. Uh, cool, let's get going. Uh, so last time, uh, I'll just quickly go over the quiz. Last time, um, we learned about LZ77. And so in quiz question one, um, you were given this decoding table and were asked basically to, uh, to decode uh, using this decoding table. Um, I think the question was really straightforward. So for the first part, you have match offset one, so that's B, and then you have match length four, so you are gonna output four extra Bs. So you have A triple B and then four extra Bs, right? Um, similarly, for the second one, you have match offset nine, so you can work it out that basically gets you here. Uh, at the beginning of the whole string, and then you have match length five, so the extra bits which you send out is AA triple B. And finally, the output string after decoding the third row is just uh, match length two and match offset two, so you just go behind two here and add two more CDs, right? So this is just like direct application of what we learned in the last class, decoding. Something which I want to highlight, and somebody asked this on Ed, I, I'm not sure if it was a private post or not, but I think this is a good question, which is, so if I looked at this string, right, the final string which I would have gotten would have been A, A, triple B, then four more Bs, um, then again A, A, triple B, and then um, C, D, C, D, C, D, okay? This would have been the input string, and then like we got this decoding table uh, here, right? But as Shubham talked about, there are various different parsing rules in LZ77. Like the parsing scheme really is not unique. And you may go for, for example, like the greedy approach to parse or like the lazy approach to parse or do dynamic programming. So there are various different ways to get to this encoding table, okay? But the good thing about the scheme really is once you have this decoding table, no matter what the par parsing, parsing scheme would have been, you would have recovered this original string. And the question also specifically mentioned the same thing, right? So if somebody was confused that, oh, given this table, uh, the uh, algo encoding algorithm which Shubham taught in class didn't really lead to this particular uh, encoded LZ77 table, that's still fine because it's just a different parsing scheme which resulted in this thing. Okay, so that's like, I guess, one thing to really understand in this problem. And then the second one was again like, uh, so I think the input was uh, Tat which is Kedar's last name. And we saw this and we were like, oh, we have to apply LZ77 to this. <laughs> so, so we did. And in this problem, actually, we... Uh, we go over and do the exact same encoding scheme which Shubham taught in class. So it was like a very specific LZ77 parser, right? And we, you were asked to like fill in this table and it kind of is uh, quite straightforward, right? So like first match literal is just TA, uh, match length is one because T gets repeated and match offset would be two, right? Following that, W is a unique symbol, uh, but after W, you get A. A is being matched three points behind, and match length is just going to be one because it's just A, right? And finally, after A, you see W A being repeated, which you had already encoded. So now you have offset to length two, which was already given to you. So you don't really have any unmatched literal after that step. And finally, you have DI which is just unmatched. So your last literal is just DI and there is no length and offset. Okay. So this is now an example of one particular passing scheme with LZ77 and encoding that. Questions on LZ77 encoding, decoding, passing. So then quiz three was around, so now you have been given an English text, but now what you did was like you change the letter such that every A becomes B, every B becomes C, so on and so forth. And the first question was like, does the STD perform similarly on both the original text and transform word? Um, and what was the answer? Somebody wants to say. Anyone? Yes. Yes, yeah. 
exactly this is this is what i want to hear with confidence yes right <laughs> so zstd doesn't really care about the exact probability distribution right? it's just looking for matches and your matches will remain as is right your literals will change so if i if if it was this example your literals would have changed uh, but like your performance would have remained the same similar okay and then the second question was like we also learned about this llm based compressor in just one class before lecture 9 and what do we think like would uh, llm based compressor perform differently okay i see some at least a few people shaking their head and yeah the answer is no and the reason really is like llm based predictor is only good as good as its pro probability model right and when you shift these symbols your probability model completely changes you need to go and update your llm probability model otherwise it's it's basically useless right it's just completely wrong model it can't really do anything and this is basically like the conceptual difference between um lz based i would say encoding schemes versus like arithmetic coding or rans where the probability is needed to be really matching up okay. then the final question for the quiz was i think i'll just tell the answer i think shivam really took half an hour <laughs> or not half an hour but 15 minutes to really drill down this thought but we are learning so many cool techniques in the class this is almost like in a sense a joke but to be really honest this is what what's going to be important once you are let's say out in the industry or working on some compressors on your own and the answer really is like always 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 try some standard compressor even before going to anything else that should be your step 0.1 uh, given any compression problem and then go and do all the other things which we learned Okay, one second. I'm gonna try this again. <laughs> okay, let me just keep this open. Okay, any questions so far? Cool. So let's get to the new material. So again, as a recap, we have learned so far about lossless compression and trade-offs between various different entropy coders. So we started the class and we learned about like the fundamental limits on a lossless compressor, which was entropy. We learned about a thumb rule, which we have seen time and again, uh, like going through this course so far to like really derive our intuition and understanding of how well the compressors are doing. Right? Uh, we followed this up by various lossless compressors. Sometimes these are also called entropy coders, and that's just because they are trying to like code something to the entropy. and we also looked at their implementation so we looked at like block codes uh, like shannon and huffman we looked at streaming codes uh, like arithmetic and ans and finally we also looked at this pattern matching code idea or a universal code which was lz77 right and we kind of wrap this all up by like okay earlier we were talking about uh, iid sources we wrapped it up by talking about how to deal with non iid sources which is basically life so we talked about context based coding and we talked about adaptive coding and yeah you'll have some questions on context based coding uh, lz77 and homework 3 so uh, look forward to it and some other idea around dealing with non iid sources so that should be fun <laughs> okay but now we are going to move to uh, the lossy compression and the first point which i want to really make very strongly is that whatever we have learned so far all of it will remain applicable in the second half of the course in fact uh, lossless compression is just a special case of lossy compression with just loss equals to 0 uh, even more so it's it's not just like at an intuitive level that okay sure lossless is loss equals to 0 uh, you will see that any practical um, compressor out there like design of any lossy compressor will involve a lossless compression part after you introduce the lossy step finally you would losslessly compress something so whatever we have learned all our intuition so far will carry forward to lossy and help us improve lossy compressors in terms of designing the loss aspect of it because the final step would be to losslessly compress some sim symbols right um so again like we'll we'll learn a lot more about this in coming lectures but this is really important like so like you really need to understand lossless for lossy um and finally like something 
really important as in lossless compression, uh, we assume discrete sources, right? So far we have always talked about finite alphabet, some discrete sources, some probability distribution over it, and then we went on to compress it, right? Uh, but in reality, in practice, nothing is discrete, right? Like all, all these signals which we are receiving, take be it image, any sensory information we are receiving, all of this is actually continuous. It's not really a discrete value. And so in second half of the course, we'll start learning about how to deal with these continuous values, right? Like, okay. And so before we even go and start, like, so again, like all sensors, images, videos, in reality are continuous sources, right? But, and the whole point of uh, storing data is to somehow represent this information, correct? Um, so let's, let's just start this lecture with like the first quiz question, which is, um, how much information do you think a continuous source has? So we have talked about entropy, we have talked about discrete sources. Um, what, what would be your guess on how much information does a continuous source has? Yeah? Uh, whatever the floating point precision of the machine is. Okay, so the answer I got was whatever the floating point precision of machine is. But at that step, you have already assumed some discretization, right? Okay. Exactly. So, okay, the answer, okay, just for the rest of the class, uh, the answer I got was that it would be whatever the precision of your machine is, like that will determine how much information the source contain. But if you think about it, at that point you have already discarded some information about the source, right? Like who says 64 bit is the fundamental uh, precision at which we should store everything. Uh, that's as arbitrary as number as it could be, right? And Actually, like a continuous num. This is it. sorry. Okay, so the answer really is infinite, right? Um, and this is like a fundamental, I would say, maths fact. Which like this infinite really stems from the fact that um, between two real numbers, you can basically find infinite mole numbers, right? So this is like a, a I don't know, a number theory 101 fact, really. And this kind of leads to like, okay, no matter what precision you store your signal to be at, unless infinite, there, there is nothing infinite, right? Whatever high end you come up with, tomorrow, let's say we go crazy with the number of bits we can store. Instead of 64 bit computers, we have 1 million bit computers. Even at that point, you're throwing away some information about the actual source you're recording. The limit will come to the physical acquiring of the source at that point, but still. This is really important. And so what this means is that you cannot represent a continuous source exactly, right? It's, it's, it's a lost cost. You can't really do anything about it. Um, and we need to approximate it, okay? And any approximation basically imply loss of information. Okay? So it's, it's very natural. You have to do lossy compression at some point. Uh, the way lossy compression literature deals with it is we introduce a parameter called distortion, which is like some measure of the loss of information. So for example, your distortion, like if, if you have seen mean square error, then your distortion looks something like expected value of x minus x hat, where x is your symbol and x hat is whatever you are representing it with. So you can imagine x hat to be 64 bit representation of whatever physical signal we are talking about. Okay, but this is just like one particular distortion. Nobody is forcing you to take it. You may come and say, oh, this distortion is not valid for me. Maybe what's valid for me is this mean absolute error, right? Which is, is just the expected value of mod of x minus x hat. And you can come up with basically any distance function, if you, if you, have, if you know about distances in maths, uh, as like a distortion measure. Okay, and the distortion you want to measure, you want to work with, would depend on the application which you are working on. In fact, uh, like in the second half of the lossy compression, when we go to multimedia, we start learning about images, videos, uh, maybe even a little bit of audio compression. You'll see that a lot of study has happened into like how these distortion measures, even though are very nice mathematically to deal with, are actually wrong just don't correlate with how humans perceive. A higher distortion might not mean uh, actually a higher uh, loss in information, so as to say. 
And so this really, just this part, choosing a distortion measure is actually very important and has really influenced the design of a lot of multimedia compressors. It's a very active area of research in various places. And we'll even have a lecture on for like, on perceptual sort of compression, which is really important for multimedia. Okay, so distortion part is clear for everyone. But it's not just about distortion, right? Sure, we decided how much information I can lose. Uh, you also, so like, after we have decided like, okay, I'm okay with some distortion, um, we then need to optimize for the number of bits used to represent the source. Okay, so you are saying I'm okay with this much error given my application. Now the question becomes very similar to what we have been studying so far, which is how can I represent the source given that I'm okay with this to happen in as few bits as possible. And that's really the rate component. Yeah. And very intuitively, like this is, I, I think, I hope this should be very obvious that really a higher rate should allow you to get a lower distortion because you can spend more bits in representing the source. So ideally, like you are choosing to allocate those bits for representing the source in a way that minimizes the distortion. Okay. And this is really the fundamental rate distortion trade-off in lossy compression. Like one of the most fundamental thing in, in lossy compression. So this is just a curve. I think we, sh we saw this in, uh, we also saw this in lecture one when I gave a lot of examples about like how this rate distortion trade-off might look for images, how it might look for audio, etc. And so if you think about this, like again, what this curve is saying, as your rate increases, so x-axis is rate, like r is for rate, d is for distortion, right? So on the x-axis, as rate increases, your distortion is decreasing, right? And this is, this is something really fundamental. And now actually you see, like, I, I have done a little bit more. I have, I have made it like a U-shaped thing. Right? I have made it like this, I have not made it like this, I have not made it like this. Uh, I, could have, I could have drawn many different cartoon curves. There is a very specific cartoon curve I drew. And that's because rate distortion has some very interesting properties and fundamental theory associated with it. And Saki actually will be talking a bit about it in the next lecture. Um, so this is like, again, like the part of information theory where there is very deep connection between lossy compression and like the theory aspects to it. You can say a lot about fundamental aspects about these things uh, given some known distributions. Okay. So really practically or in theory or anything, what are you trying to do? So. There, is, there are always two ways to think about like this rate distortion trade-off. And um, I think this is very obvious, uh, but in practice and in my life, I have found these two viewpoints very useful. So whenever you are looking at a lossy compression framework, you should really think about it in two sense. One is, let's say I have been given some distortion D. I don't know what your application is. Maybe it is that I can't tolerate an error more than something some distortion measure, I just can't tolerate more than this. If, if it is more than this, nobody is going to watch my streaming service, right? So you have been given some distortion which you are supposed to meet, you can't go above it. Um, and then the way to think about this rate distortion really is like, so given some distortion D, you want to minimize the rate. So given this distortion, you could, you could have represented the source with this many number of bits, this many number of bits, this many number of bits. And you really want to find the scheme which is like, let's say the best possible representation given that distortion. Okay. Another way to think about this problem is that, no, maybe, uh, maybe you are again a streaming service, but now you are serving sub customers which just don't have bandwidth to have 4K. So you can't really like, no matter what you do, you can't really get to this distortion because you just need way more bits to, to get there. And you can't get there, right? So another way to think about this is you are rate limited. So you have been given some rate 
at which you can transmit some number of bits, which is, which is your limit. And then again, you could, when, when you just choose those many bits and use it to represent information in different ways, you may have gotten this much distortion, all this much, all this much, right? And what you want to do is really optimize, like get the minimum distortion for that particular rate. Yeah, so this is like a, so as to say, you are always looking for this Pareto optimal rate distortion curve. Okay. This is like very obvious, but I think really important that should be drilled right now, will be used continuously in different ways. Yeah, any questions? Okay. So let's just start with some example now. Um, so let's say, uh, okay, yeah. Let's say you are measuring temperature T in a room, like say in this room. Let's say it's in Celsius at some early interval. So this is some sensor data you are recording. Uh, again, remember that the actual physical temperature is a continuous source. It actually requires infinite bit to represent it exactly, which our sensors are not able to do. Like our sensors themselves are doing something lossy when they are recording. That's okay. Uh, let's say this particular sensor is actually very sensitive uh, and actually gives you up to six decimals in Celsius when you are recording this temperature. So first data point was, I don't know, 38 point blah, 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 1.0001 degree Celsius. Next one was 36 point, again, six decimals. This is what your sensor outputting, right? Uh, so like if your sensor is actually recording this kind of data, like, an obvious question to you at that point is, do I, do I need, uh, like, how do I store it? Like, how many, how many bits should I even think of allocating to, like, represent this particular sensory data? Any, any thoughts, guesses? There, there are no wrong answers. Let's keep discussing and shooting. I just like interactive classes more. <laughs> So just whatever comes to your head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes if we, if we know a set range for the temperature in the room, like if we assume it's only going to go for 100, that's going to make it easier. That seems reasonable for a room, but you know, if we have some really weird room, it might go lower. Okay, so the answer which one of the students gave was, oh, it depends on which room you are in. Okay, like if it's a room, it's if it's a normal room and it only depends on 0 to 100, uh, which is already, I think, quite a high variance for a room. You are like going from freezing water to boiling it. So I wouldn't want to be in that room. But still, like, okay, if this is a normal room, <laughs> uh, then this that, that gives me some information versus I don't know if it's an abnormal room even beyond that, uh, then you might need more bits. And actually, that's correct. Like, this was really, in some sense, I would say a trick, but not really a trick. A lot of time in practice designing lossy compressors just goes into figuring out this question essentially which is it really depends on the on the application you are working with right so let's say if you are like the example i came up with was not room temperature but maybe like you are controlling the ac hello yeah if you are controlling the ac using uh, this particular thermostat you might want a few more decimals versus like if you are using this data just on your Fitbit or something to determine, oh, should I take hoodie with me out or not, right? Th these, these two are very different things. So a Fitbit would want to store this data at a very different level of distortion and with very different number of bits than maybe a thermostat or a car, car like uh, sensitive temperature measure in an industrial setting, right? So this basically leads to which we always need to keep asking, which is, we first of all need to de decide on the distortion we are okay with when we go lossy compress such a data, uh, right? Uh, so in this particular case, continuing with the example, in this particular case, I think all of us can agree six decimals behind temperature seems just wasteful, no matter almost what the application is, unless it's like you're doing some material science, <laughs> maybe, uh, seems very wasteful, right? So question then changes now slightly. So now I have told you that six seems wasteful for whatever application we are working with. So given like now that you look at this series, 
I don't know. What, what do you think are some reasonable values to encode? Again, not trick. It's like not even. So this is just basics. We are not even going to get into hard technical problems <laughs> yet. No one. <laughs> Okay, uh, I would have just dropped all the decimals, right? So it's something temperature in Celsius. I don't really care if it's 38.1 or 37.9. Um, and if I was storing this data for my thing, so again, I said just some reasonable values to encode being reasonably hand wavy. You can come back and say, no, I want another decimal. It's okay. But some reasonable values could be just storing 38, 36, 37, right? Again, 37, 35. Correct? And at this point, we have already introduced loss. So just rounding of this data has led to an introduction of the loss. Okay? And this is really important. <laughs> and it's really simple technique, but it's a first basic lossy compression technique, which is you can just round the data. <laughs> and that, that introduces loss, right? Uh, this is not exactly, but similar to converting the data types. So like converting the data type from float to int. Uh, maybe the sensor data in practice you have been given is actually, I don't know, float 64. Somebody is using float 64 to uh, encode income of someone. Seems really wasteful, right? Like as soon as you get the data, the first thing you would do is convert it into float 32, maybe. And oh, or like just some ints. At that point, okay, actually not ends. <laughs> like maybe they care about, people care about sense. So, uh, <laughs> but as soon as you do that, you have already introduced some loss, right? You have introduced some distortion into your source symbol. Okay, and that's really the, like one of the most, how should I say, obvious ways in which we are doing lossy compression going about, right? And it's, it's quite useful, just changing data types, that's, that's lossy compression, and it might lead to much fewer bits to represent anything. Uh, post that. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay. The more formal way to think about the obvious rounding thing which I said, and like very obvious things which we have been talking about, is quantization. So what basically we did in the previous example, it's called quantization. And so this is not the dictionary definition. I kind of got it from uh, Professor Gray from Stanford, uh, who, who is really an expert in this area. Uh, in one of his notes, he says that, and I really like this simple definition, which is quantization is just the process of mapping a continuous source to discrete source. As soon as you do that, you have moved into the lossy compression world. Okay. So some obvious points, right? Like quantization is a lossy process. It introduces distortion. Uh, and in fact, it is a fundamental operation in lossy compression. Like I, yeah, I don't think any compressor in lossy compressor in the world exists, which doesn't do some form of quantization somewhere, uh, no matter what domain, what application, what rate distortion level you are talking about. So it is really like just, it's present somewhere as part of the lossy compression scheme. Uh, so some technical terms, the quantized values are called symbols, sometimes called symbols, sometimes called code words. Um, and the set of available quantized values is called, sometimes called code book, sometimes called dictionary. Okay. So in the previous example, which we looked at where we had 38.1, blah, blah, blah. Let's say these were the only five symbols. So I got like rounded it and I got 38, 36, 37, 37, 35. And so in this particular case, my, uh, my like symbols or code words after quantization were just these rounded up things. And if you look at this, they, it basically had only four unique values, like 35, 36, 37, 38. Okay. And this is really just your code book. So these are the four quantized values you would transmit. Okay, so the next obvious thing which we are going to ask, so doing this quantization reduced to some sort of 
uh, we could think of it in two ways. One, we could have thought of it as like I did rounding, right? But another way to think about this, this same thing is really that I had this code book, right? And then I wanted to represent all these, all these symbols using the code book. And so I will just basically choose the element which is nearest in the code book in some sense. Being extremely hand wavy, we'll, we'll get and fill in the details, right? But talking in English, it makes sense, right? Like that's what you would do. These are the only four values you can transmit ever. Uh, then you would just choose the value which is nearest to one of these four values. Okay, so then let's say now I have a code book of size n. Uh, what is the rate going to be? Again, no trick questions, nothing wrong. Another way to think about it, think about like, okay, now we are, now we are in a world which you guys understand, hopefully. These are discrete, right? Like your code words are discrete. Let's say in this case, there are four elements, four code words. How would you transmit these four code words? Let's say it's uniformly distributed amongst these four words. How many bits you would have required? Okay, I see a couple people pointing two, right? Why two? What what exactly is two? Exactly. So it's just the log two of the side of size of the code book, because what you can do in this case is, let's say I have code word one, code word two, um, so on so forth, code word n, right? And if I have to transmit just the code words, I could encode it by just encoding the index, right? And then if I only have to send the index, so for example, let's say, uh, if I receive index i, I'll reconstruct code word i. My decoder will reconstruct code word i, okay? So in this case, you only need to send log n bits, right? So if you have n, code words, you only need to send actually log n bits. And so if you have a code book of size n, irrespective of what exactly the code vector is, uh, your rate is just going to be log 2 of n. So again, like, sorry, there should be a seal here. Um, let me just add it now. Right. Uh, another way to think about this is if you had r bits per symbol, you could have really used 2 raised to power r unique values, right? And this is the exact same principle if we go back to, I think, lecture 5 about uh, asymptotic equipartition property which Saki talked about, right? This is the exact same thing. You can just, you can just count the indices and the sequence and use that to just encode the index. Okay, so this tells, right, if you have a code book of size n, you need roughly log n bits per symbol to transmit it. Okay, and this tells you about the rate distortion trade-off now, right, immediately. So let's say you had a opportunity for higher rate. In that case, you would have a larger code book, right? Uh, a larger code book would result in a lower distortion because now you have more options to choose from. Alternate way to think about the same thing, if you had, I don't know, a lower code book, in that case, you'd probably have a higher distortion and then you would need fewer bits. Right, maybe let's just uh, quickly write it down. So your rate is higher, that basically means your number of code words is higher, and that would typically means your distortion goes down. Okay. Or other way if we have to think, if you're, I don't know, if you're okay with higher distortion, you would do so by reducing your code, uh, code book size, and that would lead to a lower rate. Right, so you, you see the the trade-off between rate distortion immediately in this scheme. 
Yeah. Any questions so far? Okay. So now let's talk about another example. Uh, like we have been saying, the lossy compression makes sense in continuous sources. And whenever continuous sources come in life, like the first thought uh, for everyone <laughs> should, like modeling continuous sources comes in life, the first thought should go to a Gaussian random variable. Uh, is everyone comfortable with Gaussian random variable? Yeah? Good. Okay. So now let's say you have symbol X, uh, set of symbols X, which are coming from a Gaussian source. And let's just say it has mean zero variance one. Um, okay. So it's a continuous source, right? Um, and for whatever reason, uh, your friend comes and says, oh, I have... I can only send like one bit per symbol. I just can't do more than that. That that's my budget. That's the I am in I don't know 1930s or whatever 1960s. There wasn't a link then. Like and I can only send a bit per second or something. But this is my source. Uh, now, what do you think? Uh, what's like some reasonable values to encode for this source? Mm -hmm. The sign, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. So one of the students suggested like, okay, maybe we should encode the sign. And that basically just comes from the fact that like Gaussian really is like a symmetrical distribution, right? In terms of probability density. And so if you have only one bit that says you can only send some two choices, maybe sending the sign makes intuitive sense. Okay. so. Again, we are, we, we are not saying so far if it's the best. You can't say if it is the best way to do until you come and tell me what's the distortion I'm really okay with. Right? Uh, but it still makes intuitive sense that, okay, hopefully whatever distortion someone comes up with will be symmetric around zero and otherwise they probably, something is wrong or Gaussian model is wrong, right? Uh, but it's okay. Okay, so one reasonable valuable value to encode is sine of x and that's just because your distribution is symmetric around zero. Yeah, everyone with me? Okay, so let's continue. So your friend says uh, you can just transmit one bit per symbol and so you say okay I'll encode the sine of x hat. Like, so sorry I'll just encode the sine of x so I'll no matter what my x is at each of these symbols, I'll just send you the sign. Okay. So now let's say your friend receives a positive value for x hat. Uh, what should he really recover? Like, what should he, like, what should he represent that symbol with? So, other words, what should be the quantized value of the recovered symbol? To remind, like, it was like, for example, last time from 37.1, we went to 37, right? So that's the quantized value. And to actually answer this question, this is what I was just saying a second ago, you need to dis decide what distortion are we okay with. So different distortions might mean a different recovered symbol may make better sense. Okay, so let's say we are talking about mean square error distortion, one specific distortion. Any guesses? Okay, so this one is technical. This one is not a joke question. <laughs> The variance. Why do you say so? Okay. Uh, actually, no. <laughs> uh, that's that's incorrect. So the answer really is the expected value of x given your observed symbol, which is x hat greater than zero, and your obvious question should be where did where does this come from? Um, really celebrated, uh, do I have links? Actually, I don't have links on these slides, but it's okay. So this is a really celebrated result, and it's called minimum mean square estimator. So minimum, like same mean square estimator. And if you have taken, um, I guess, a signal processing class, uh, for mean square error, this should be obvious for you. 
but it's okay if you if you if you don't know this result for this class purposes you can assume that this is true what this mean is that if somebody comes and says to me that i have x hat greater than 0 okay uh, the value which minimizes this thing given x hat greater than 0 is basically expected value of x given x hat greater than 0. Um, there are more references in the notes uh, which should be pushed by now on the uh, uh, on the class notes website. Uh, so if you are eager, you can go look into this. Uh, there are some signal processing references there also, which you can go through. Uh, but yeah, so this is like really, this is a really fundamental result. A lot of people with lossy compression will just like replace it. Uh, but it's really important to understand that this, this particular code book is for mean square estimator, right? So this is like a minimum mean square estimator. If I came up with some crazy distortion function, I don't know, I could have come up with, um, uh, I don't know, like let's say, uh, I don't know, let's say I came up with a distortion function like this. It may not be true or some, some, some more non-linear, like a neural net x minus x hat something, okay? So the point which I really want to make here is that this optimal code book, once you have the rate, so you basically know your code book and you really need to know the distortion for which you are optimizing, otherwise, there is no optimal code book. You need to be always like whenever somebody comes and talks to you, talks to you about lossy, ask them what's the distortion we are talking about. Like, or you might have to define the appropriate distortion. Um, and actually, if you work this out, again, this is, this is there in the notes. Uh, so this, or we can just quickly work it out here also, uh, just so that people feel comfortable. So, Expected value of x given x hat greater than 0. So we know fx is Gaussian, which just means its density is this. Correct. And expected value of x given x hat equals to 0 just by the definition would be minus infinity to infinity x times fx given x hat greater than 0 of x dx and this is just a conditional distribution so you can use base rule to recover this. Um, in this case it's symmetric so f of x given x hat greater than 0 of x. Uh, since it's symmetric around 0 it will just be twice this distribution so it will be 2 times f of x given x. Okay, you can you can show this. This is just straightforward. Uh, this is straightforward um, maths. And so, if you write this down, this basically becomes um, let's say square root two over pi times x e raised to power minus x pi two dx. And actually, it's x hat greater than zero. So this is this. If x is greater than zero. 0 else, right, to then equals to 0. So this is also called like, uh, uh, this is just half Gaussian, right, like it's just looking at one side of the Gaussian. And if you work out this integral, uh, it's actually quite straightforward, like you, you do a variable substitution here of x squared by 2. Okay, this is not a calculus class, so we can skip this, you can trust me on this part. Uh, <laughs> This thing will basically, and, and again, like notes have more details. So if you want to look into, um, you can, you're happy to look, uh, please like check it out. So this gives you square root two over pi, which is this. And then 
expected value of x, again, given x hat less than 0 is just symmetric, so it's just negative value of that. Okay. So in this example, uh, so this match was just to kind of uh, do it once in front of you guys so that you feel comfortable really with what's happening. Um, it's not really, not really required from the purpose of like, don't, well not as you may, you know, like signal processing a lot. So don't worry about if you are seeing this for the first time in your life and are like, okay. But this is really one of the, um, I don't know, say one of the most celebrated results in signal processing used hundreds of different of places. Main takeaway really is, okay, so if somebody gave you a Gaussian and said, okay, one bit per symbol, that basically implies you have a code book which can only contain two symbols. And one of the choices for mean square estimator, like if you were minimizing distortion for uh, mean square estimator is you would choose these values. Okay. So again, the communication scheme more importantly looks like this. Oops, what did I do? Okay. So let's just quickly talk about the sort of scheme which we did, like what did we do? We started with a continuous source, okay? We decided that we want to encode it at one bit per symbol. Actually, let me not even put arrows because some of these are decisions, right? We thought that, okay, encoding sign seems a reasonable thing to do, okay? So what you did was you communicated and encoded just the sign, so this thing, you encoded, which is a discrete distribution. So you can see this, this step here, like encoding a discrete distribution is where everything we learned in lossless will come into play, right? It doesn't right now, but you can already see what's going to happen. Okay. So you encode the sign, you send over index of the code book or send over is just like, or encoded the index of the code book. On the other side, your decoder receives this, this exact same thing, right? Index of the code book and use it to recover the sign. So they know the sign, but actually not just the sign since you guys agreed on mean square estimation. So you already had the code word share, code book either shared or can be computed independently at the decoder side. And that basically told them, okay, I'll just represent my thing as given the sign as plus minus square root two by pi. And that would minimize my overall mean square distortion. This is really the scheme which we did. Okay, everyone with me? Like at least, uh, Schematically, we understand what's what's happening, like in both these examples, and how are, how are we introducing loss? What are the key things to look out for? Right. We'll keep on making it more and more formal as we go ahead. Cool. So, what we did was so this is the Gaussian histogram. So, like same same Gaussian normal zero comma one. I generated a lot of samples. I just plotted it as a histogram. This is X. Uh, these are the counts. So this is not the probability, but so you can see like different counts. Okay, and this is roughly my Gaussian, right? So in this whole scheme, you basically did two things, which is how we'll go ahead and formalize this, okay? You decided a decision boundary for one bit per symbol. So one of your decision boundary was x greater than zero. The other decision boundary was, I don't know, x less than zero, correct? And then you went ahead and mapped it to a specific value of the code book. And so let's say if you have a point here, like if, if your actual sample was, I don't know, two point something, you would basically just map it to the, so this, this value is square root two over pi. Uh, you'll just map it to this guy. Or if there was a point here, like you'll basically see which point of the decision boundary uh, your actual symbol lies to, 
and just map it to the corresponding codebook word. Okay. And so more formally, like exactly the whole thing which we did is an example of something called scalar quantization. Okay. So the idea of scalar is like you are just looking at each individual symbol and you are defining two things. One, so now here what I am showing is input signal x. So another way to show the same thing and the output x, x hat. Okay. Your quantizer really is a function. It takes an input x and map it, maps it to a quantized value x hat. Okay, so you can see this function as like a 2D xy plot, right? Um, and the two things which we looked at was the decision thresholds. So right now we only talked about one bit, but obviously we could have decided we could have had two bits, we could have had n bits, we could have various different number of bits, right? And so a scalar quantizer is basically being defined by the decision thresholds. So you are selecting uh, the regions which will be mapped to a single value and then the corresponding quantized values. Again, in the previous example, uh, my decision regions were x greater than zero, x less than zero. So my decision threshold was zero and my quantized values was plus minus square root two over pi. But more generally, right, I can select given any bit rate, I can select the code book. So I know exactly the quantized values which are going to be part of that code book. And then I can select these decision thresholds. Okay. Again, like here, this particular uh, quantized value was determined based on optimizing MSC where we did expected value. We calculated this expected value, right? But I could have chosen this, I could have chosen something else. So these two elements completely determine a scalar quantizer. And then, okay, so I don't have it here, but something which you see lately is like your decision regions need not be uniform. Like nobody is saying that they need to be uniform. So like basically what I mean is like each of these widths on X, they can be different. That's still a scalar quantizer. Like you, you can decide what these needs to be. And that can be determined based on whatever your distortion function really is. Okay, great. Everyone with me? Mm. Okay, so then, uh, great. Uh, so, we looked at quantization, we understand this method, seems very simple. Uh, any suggestions on what, what more we can do with this quantization? Again, looking back at maybe what we did in lossless compression. So right now, remember a scheme, right now, uh, sorry, yeah, that page somehow vanished, which I just wrote, but okay, uh, um, yeah, okay. So what did we do? We took one symbol at a time, we decide where it lies uh, in the corresponding decision threshold, and then we map it to some quantized value x hat. We encode it, transmit it, do whatever, okay? Can we do something, uh, oh, any other ideas actually? Again, like you can think about what we, what we, things we did in lossless. Based on our previous symbol, we could adjust the decision thresholds. Okay, so one idea which I got was, uh, one, one student said is like based on the previous symbol, we can adjust the threshold. That's actually a very valid idea. <laughs> People do that, but that's one step even more ahead. Uh, we are not gonna talk about this in today's class, but again, um, I have some added some references in the notes. So if you are, if you want to look into that, you can look into that. We'll see some example of that when we learn about, uh, I think, image uh, codecs like BPG, etc. But that's that's a perfectly valid idea. Even before that, think of this as a parallel to lecture one or two <laughs> when we started with lossless. Well, what was one thing which always gave you a better compression if you didn't care about complexity? 
Huh? Sorry. Yes. So the answer is gave. It's like combine into blocks, right? So that was one idea which seemed to have worked really well for lossless compression. Um, question is, can can we use it? Like, does it work well? Like, how or how does it do for the lossy compression? Maybe combining symbols together, we could have done better instead of just deciding based on a single single symbol. And that's exactly the idea of vector quantization, right? Um, so scalar to vector, vector kind of refers to the, in some sense, like the symbols in a block, right? Um, idea is exactly like I have written the same like how the student put it. Uh, maybe maybe we can work with two symbols at a time or three or n symbols at a time. Uh, can it do something better? Okay. Um, to start with the discussion, let's say we are working with just two symbols. Uh, so then you can think of your x as blocks of two, right? Like so, you are just so there are many different ways of thinking of vector quantization. Uh, so you can think of it as like you generated two n symbols and converting it into groups, two groups of sizes n each. So they're like similar of block codes. I, I'll just take the two symbol, two symbol, two symbol, two symbol, and then I'll try to quantize this vector instead of quantizing just the scalar. to think of this. It could also have been, instead of block codes, vector is a bit more general. Instead of block, uh, you could have thought of it as two sensors which are measuring the same source. Right? So you had, so one way is you can think you had a single temperature sensor and then you were clubbing every two symbol and that's a vector of size two and then you will do something on top of it. But maybe it was just two different sensors, two different time series. And then that can be represented vector individually. Um, or you could have even had two different sensors just measuring two different sources. Right? You could have one sensor measuring temperature of one room, another measuring of another room. Right? So vector is just like, you could have combined any two tuples and they would have made a vector. So just like, it's, it's a bit more general. But like the basic way to think about really is like, uh, as the student also pointed out, it's basically block codes. Okay, so now let's say uh, I am I have a specific case. I have a block size of two. Okay, um, and I want to design a vector on reasons and decision thresholds instead of a longer time like we did in the Gaussian. We'll do it over a 2D plane, and I'll, I'll show, some, show you some to it. But where are we? Yeah. Uh, so I want to compare it, like right, like whether it helps or not. I want to compare it with the one bit per symbol scalar quantizer. Uh, what is the size of codebook allowed now? So again, remember the scheme, like now I'll map each x1, x2 to, let me actually just write it down. So you'll have a code book, which is, let's say, indexed by 1 to n, some, some size code book, code vectors. Uh, you get a tuple, let's say, x1, x2, and you want to find, you'll map it to one of these indices and then encode that index, right? So what can be the size of your code book if you were, if, if your rate was one bit per symbol? Like, that's what you want to work with? Sure, anyway, go, anyway, go. Okay, four, four is the answer by the student, why four? Exactly, so the student said we have two symbols, um, so basically one bit per symbol. So this is exact same logic as we worked through uh, during the block codes, right? This allows for two bit per block, correct? And then this basically allows, so as I said, like we are encoding block as like one element of the code book. So this basically says I can have four uh, distinct code words. So now doing this thing basically allowed you to increase the number of code words which you can have. Okay, like more generally, so four kind of comes from again um, 
this one bit oh sorry uh, this one bit per symbol and two symbol per code vector which basically gives you four uh, generalizing this exact thing so let's say you have vectors or if you are more comfortable with the idea of blocks blocks which are of size k and your rate is r bits per symbol then your code book is of the size 2 raised to r times k it's like generalizing the exact same thing okay in other words your rate is just again sorry there should be uh, yeah um, there should be seal everywhere so um, i apologize but like uh, i hope you guys understand the seal part for now um, your rate per symbol if you have an n size code word okay uh, so now here what i am showing is a 2d gaussian <laughs> right so here i am plotting x1 so nothing nothing fancy it's just like same x1 which was standard gaussian so it's symmetric around zero this is x2 which is again symmetric around zero so this is how your tuples might look like so for example your one symbol might look like this and that corresponds to i don't know x12 x21.5 let's say okay so these are just a pdf uh, of the um, city function of the two dimensional gaussian okay let's say i want to represent it with one bits per symbol so you guys just told me that uh, i can have four code words correct so now any on what code words could be or let's not start with the code words let's start with the same thing uh have to determine some decisions right some obvious ones let's let's not worry about the optimality at all like if you were given this what would you do split it into quadrants so, okay so that's uh, so we'll just look through some examples so one is so let's say this is origin and so what i can do is i can split it into quadrants so these are my oops these are my decision thresholds right this okay so these are my four different decision thresholds and since this source is symmetric i know somewhere in the circle basically i can have like the because it's spherically symmetric so your quantize values would be somewhere here if this was like especially for let's just stick with the distortion mean square error let's not complicate things so let's say a distortion is mean square error this is option 1 okay uh okay this is option 1 let's say your friend comes and says let's see your friend comes and says i don't like this um i i i don't like my quantized symbols being being in the quadrants uh i want to have some quantized symbols on the axis again like this would be at the same radius let's not even worry about the radius so that you can figure out like using the similar mean minimum mean square estimator kind of a logic uh so what are the decision regions in this case yeah okay very nice <laughs> got the visual decision <laughs> region from some student so in this case you are going to look at the point which is like halfway through sort of right which is nearest to okay okay yeah so we are going to look at this point similarly your decision regions will turn out to be this okay any ideas like let's say if we were doing uh mean square estimation which of these two would be better shouldn't it be the same 
Yeah, so one of the students says... Exactly. So it should be the same. One of the students says it should be the same because like our distribution is spherically symmetric. Like it doesn't matter how am I rotating this whole thing. If you know of any orthonormal basis, you can use that and you'll basically get the same thing. The idea really here is that what I want to highlight quickly is uh, your code vectors could be anything. They could be complicated in your coordinate system, maybe not so complicated in your coordinate system. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Right, because you only have to send the index of the code vector. Okay. But let me be, um, I don't know, a bit more adventurous. And let's say I pick one of my code words to be in the center. I am like very greedy. I'm like, I, I don't know, I want origin. I love origin. <laughs> so I picked one of my code words here. Okay. In that case, again, yeah. Going by the spherical symmetry, my other three code words will lie somewhere on a circle and it doesn't matter where exactly, but somewhere spherically distributed. Correct. And in this case, my decision regions could be determined by basically what you are doing. You are basically having a separating hyperplane between any of these two points. Actually, it should pass through origin. So these are just the separating hyperplanes between any of these points, correct? And so your decision boundaries would just be this, right? These would be your decision boundaries. What this means is like if you get a point x1, x2 here, you would map it to this particular guy. If you get it here, you will map it to this particular guy, so on and so forth. And actually, in this case, it's interesting that you can show that this is not optimal. Actually, um, I have a notebook, which we'll see in a second uh, before we head out for today, where we can see that this kind of performs better. OK, so more formally, what did we do uh, in vector quantization? So this is like, again, just generalization of, of what we saw before. Uh, so your vector quantizer is just a mapping from some k-dimensional space to a code book, where your code book is n dimension n vectors. So it's a dictionary which is comprising of n k-dimensional vectors. Then you have a mapping from this vector x, which is in k-dimension, your function q to y bar. Um, and then where if x belongs to some partition of the space, uh, you will basically map it to the ith code word. So for example, here in this example, like this was, uh, this was one partition of the space. This was another partition of the space. Okay. And so this is just mathematically. So your, your partition should span like the whole space so that any vector which is coming in that space should be mapped to some quantized value, right? Otherwise, you can have a symbol which you don't know where to map to. And then in this case, we saw that the rate will be just log n by k bits per sample. Cool. So I want to highlight a couple of things like vector quantization. So basically, the kind of benefits we can exploit is that it can obviously exploit the dependence between vector components, right? So like that's what we are working with. I'll give, give you an example of this thing really quickly. And another thing is we can have much more general decision regions. So to give example of both of these things, let's say you had some distribution x1, x2 in 2D space instead of Gaussian. Let's say it looked something like this, okay? And this just basically means it's like x1, x2 always have the same sign, right? Like if x1 is positive, x2 is positive, if x1 is negative, x2 is negative, so on and so forth. Okay? Um, if you were to do a uniform scalar quantization of this thing, what, what were you doing? You were basically making a grid along x and a grid along y. And your decision regions would have looked like these blocks here. And in this particular example, you can work it out since I have 36 blocks. Uh, for 
vector of size 2, it's approximately log 2 to the base 6. This is your rate. But obviously, if I knew this fact, that my distribution always is correlated, like x1, x2 are always together positive or negative, I could have instead done vector quantization. And I could have only defined my regions as these square blocks here, which overlap with my actual density. Correct? In that case, I don't need all the different code words corresponding to the other side. And in this case, you can again work it out, but it's just basically log 18 by 2. So that's, that's your bits, which is, um, I think, something like this. So in this case, you can save half a bit for, it's obvious, right, same distortion, because we have the exact same regions um, in the decision regions. So this is how vector quantization can be really helpful, right? So it, it can help you exploit correlation. But actually, it's, uh, it's much stronger than that. Uh, and we'll not cover this in class. Again, this goes into a little bit of signal processing. But you can work out so some comments without proofs. Um, and I think we have some proofs again in the notes. So if you, are, if you are mathematically inclined, interested, I would encourage you to go read them, work them out. Uh, but basically, what you can show that optimal regions are generally not uniform, which is like basically saying scalar quantization, even in simple uniform IID case. So like previous example, it was like you had correlated sources. But what now I'm saying is like you can show that mathematically. Like if you were to break it down into square grids, that's not optimal even for uniform IID case. And the idea really is you can have an hexagonal lattice. So a uniform, okay, a uniform encoder really is what? It's, uh, let's see, sorry. So a uniform encoder is grids like this, right? Like square grids like this, something for uniform IID, scalar quantization. Again, so I have determined some decision regions, I have determined the code book quantized values. What I'm saying is there is another grid. So if I take my quantized values as shifted half from each other, like somewhere like, so each next row is in between the next one, something like a honeycomb structure. And if these were my decision regions, you can um, you can work out that, I don't know, the, the region corresponding to one thing would look like hexagonal. And this vector quantizer is actually better than the first one. And you can work out the math, and it basically turns out to be, like, for same rate, it turns out to be, like, your MSE turns out to be around 4% lower. Okay? This is a good idea to know, and this is called, like, lattice quantization or Voronoi diagrams. Um, and you can also accommodate more than two dimensions. So this is just like a hexagonal lattice in two dimension. But it's actually, now you can see you can get very creative with respect to this lattice design and your distortion. And that can actually do much better than just doing scalar quantization. Um, in fact, uh, this paper by Ziv on universal quantization. <laughs> okay, sorry, before that. So there are two comments here you see. Uh, one is that your, obviously vector quantization helps, even in the most trivial of cases. But the second thing is, uh, it helps, but is it? Like, like scalar uniform quantizer, I don't have to do anything. I just like divided my thing in like fixed bits, didn't have to think anything. Like 32-bit floats, that's my scalar vector quantizer, scalar quantizer, uniform scalar quantizer. This one I had to figure out, oh, this is how I need to work out my vectors. This needs to be the letters, and then, and this is the optimal one, and that it gives like 4% benefit, okay? So the takeaway really is, is that, and this is like a paper uh, by Ziv, who's like same Lempel Ziv, um, and here he shows that for certain cases, like we'll not go in details, for certain cases, you can show that scalar quantizer doesn't take more than 0.754 bits per sample higher than vector for any design. Okay, so in general, your optimal regions are not easy to compute, uh, right? And may even give you very less 
value addition to whatever quantization scheme you are designing. So you need to be careful when designing on how much computational complexity am I going to increase if I'm designing a practical compressor around vector quantization. So you can see it's like the same idea around the block codes, right? Like block codes are amazing, will give you great performance, great theoretical guarantees, but they are exponential in terms of complexity and that really makes them uh, like uh, rare in practice relatively and we had to come around workarounds. Things similar is the case with vector quantization. Okay, so just the last thing, I'll go five minutes over. Uh, Okay, so in general, we saw that we got this hexagonal lattice. We had to work out the maths. We actually didn't show the maths, but you can look at the notes. Uh, or even before, right, we had to like really figure out what's the optimal value. Uh, and it's kind of obvious, like as we are working through this, right, like that your quantized value and decision regions are intertwined. Your the quantized value will depend on the decision region, and the decision region will depend on the nearby quantized values. And these things are really hard to compute. And so one way to resolve this in practice is we can do some sort of an iterative algorithm, right? Um, before I move on, have you guys seen this before, like this vector quantization idea? Like, think about what we are trying to do. Sorry? Clustering. clustering, okay, exactly. So one of the students said clustering. So we are exactly doing clustering, right? Given the sample points, we are trying to figure out the decision regions, clusters, in other words, uh, under which like we have one quantized value. So if you know about clustering, you would have heard of the k-means algorithm in one of your machine learning class. Um, and basically, like the is very similar to k-means algorithm. In fact, it's the same thing. Um, it's also called Lloyd Max algorithm or generalized Lloyd algorithm if, if you are coming from a compression angle or signal processing or quantization world. But if you witnessed ML and clustering before, you would have seen this as k-means. Um, and k-means is just a special case of generalized Lloyd. Generalized Lloyd is a bit more general as the name suggests. <laughs> um, and we are not going to look into it. But basically, if you want to, so the thing which I say, if you want to cluster your data points into n clusters corresponding to the k-book, right? So we had the n points in the code book. You can think of them as n clusters, right? Uh, which is basically the same as k in k-means. And you choose these points such that the average distortion is minimized. And this is just like a fun historical note, uh, which you can use. It was, it's actually a very old algorithm, wasn't even published, published in 1982. And basically generalized Lloyd, which is specialized to the squared error is the k-means clustering algorithm, which you would have seen. And so the main idea of k-means clustering is like, given some data point book and the corresponding partition of the data points, right? So you want to figure out I have been told what's my n. I have been told the size of my code book. So in other words, rate is given. Now I need to figure out what should be my optimal decision regions and the quantized values, clusters, and decision boundaries. Now how k-means work is you basically do it iteratively. So given a code book, you basically compute the best partition for the data points. And then given a partition of the data points, you compute the optimal code book. And then you keep repeating until convergence. So we don't have time, so I'm not going to go into the algorithmic details, but there is some pseudocode here. And the idea is, again, very simple. Like, it's quite detailed, so we can you can go over. But you start with some centroids, which are, other words, your quantized values. Uh, till some convergence, you first determine clusters. So you basically assign each symbol or data to some centroid. And then, given these clusters, you compute the new centroids. And you keep doing this till some convergence is hit, and that gives you these clusters and centroids. And something just remember, like, don't get confused. K is the size of the code book, right? Like, K is the number of clusters in K means, which we have been calling N. 
So just k in our discussion so far was the size of the vectors. Yeah. And so you can you can go over this. Um, I just quickly want to show there is this notebook. Okay, so this is just a notebook on k means. Uh, so did a bunch of stuff. All the all the data from here can be thought here. So again, so we talked about this. This is just like a two D, um, oops, just like the two D Gaussian. I just generated some number of samples, and then for k equals to four. Sorry, let's just say rate one bits per symbol. So again, four. Uh, we we want to determine four different centroids and region. Uh, we just run the k means algorithm. And so it's an iterative algorithm. So you can see that okay, I started with these four four different class are four different regions, four different crosses are the four different quantized values you would have used. And as you keep running this, okay, you get something which is spherically symmetrical. It converges to something spherically symmetrical. So these four are your quantization points, and different colors are the regions. Similarly, you can do so with more number of code words. You could have given more weight. Um, and now you start with something like this. Oh, by the way, this is spherically symmetric, right? Like we discussed earlier, so it seems right. And so if you had like eight different code words, you keep doing this. Now it looks something different. Now it looks something which turned out more towards the other center. So you can see, right? Like k means, by the way, is not unique, right? It depends on the initial points you start working on it with. And finally, what you can do is do two things. Like you can look at it. You can plot the distortion, which is mean squared error, average mean squared error, as your number of iterations are increasing in k-means. Obviously, that goes down because it's trying to optimize for the distortion. It's trying to find the points and regions which does that. And also, you can you can look at the mean squared distortion with respect to the code book size. So code book size is the rate, and you can look at what distortion did it converge to. And now you see that uh, rate distortion curve kind of showing up here, right? Like very obviously. So you have some mean squared distortion. So you increase code book size, that decreases. And GL is just generalized Lloyd. So I'll leave it here. Um, actually, no, I want to just let you guys know you can. Um, ah, why is this not running? Sorry. Okay. So I also ran k-means on images, so it's it's quite well commented. So you can go look at it. So I just chose um, I don't know thousand different MNIST images, ran clustering on it. These were my different cluster centers. So in this case, if you think about, I'm not working with vectors of size two. I'm actually working with so this is MNIST, so vectors of size twenty-eight times twenty-eight, twenty-eight square. That's really my k. And I can still do clustering, and I can assign bit words, and you can look again, look at MSC versus number of clusters, and again, this is like a rate distortion kind of curve. So you can you can go and play with this notebook. So this is just important because your k need not be two; it can be much higher. And this is like, at, in some sense, you have already started looking into one idea of lossy compression of images, which is I can just cluster my images, and I can assign bits accordingly. And yeah, so this is the curve I'm gonna leave you guys with. So here you see blue, which is what we have been ob we observed through k means, um, and you also see something in red, which says d of r two raised to power two r, and that's basically the theoretical bound for Gaussian. And Saki will talk more about how how you get that, like how do you show that you ca you couldn't have done anything better than this red curve, no matter wh whatever algorithm you came up in with the world. Vector quantizer, predictive vector quantizer for this Gaussian IID case, so on and so forth. Cool. Um, yeah. Sorry, I went over five minutes, but thanks <laughs> for staying with me. <laughs>